So I'm hoping everybody's here. Hi, Dahlia. Um, hi to all of our lovely audiences. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to Learning to be Local. Um, it's part of the Future of the Art Market series curated in collaboration with Lucy Solit and Creative United. There are a few housekeeping items to make you aware of. Uh, this webinar will be recorded in its entirety and will be published on the FOTUM uh, microsite at a later date. So you can access um, live audio captioning if required via auto.ai um, and it can be enabled via the closed captions at the bottom of your screen. So bear in mind that captions are not 100% accurate due to the nature of the technology. So please send any queries via the Q&A function on your Zoom. So the safe space information is on the website. Please abide by it. And Q&A's uh, comments and questions from audience is encouraged. Um, and it would be great um, if you can use your first name and where you are from. Um, but that's, of course, up to yourself. Socials uh, for today, um, please share your thoughts um, and questions, comments using the hashtag Photum UK. And remember to tag at Creative United UK and ourselves. So just to introduce um, ourselves, um, I'm Patricia Fleming and I'm director at Patricia Fleming Gallery in Glasgow and delighted to have with us um, Thalia um, Spiridou, our sales director, um, who will co-chair with me today. Um, we had hoped to be hosting today's event um, from our new exhibition, which opens at the beginning of November, to give you a sneak preview, um, post by Kate B. Robertson, but unfortunately, um, uh, and to be safe, um, Scottish Government advice is to keep working from home. Um, so the exhibition is available online through our website and it will remain um, installed, the physical show, until the end of December. So I really hope, fingers crossed, some of you will get to see the real thing when restrictions have eased. So I'm going to hand you over to Thalia, who's going to introduce our panel briefly. Thanks, Thalia. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you all for being here with us today. So we're delighted to have uh, with us today Zane Dada, who is uh, currently program manager at the charity Maslaha and is a co-founder of the Kidir Collective, which is a platform for British Muslim artists. Zane has worked at the intersection of arts, community and research, and he has recently published research uh, on community arts organizations called State Survival and Sustainability, the Future of Community Arts as a Winston Churchill Travel Fellow. Uh, we have Rose Lejeune with us today, who is a curator and researcher focused on creating sustainable cross-sector mechanisms to support the production and collection of contemporary art across a range of materials and mediums that artists use today. Uh, Rose is also the Director of Performance Exchange and the Associate Curator for the Delfina Foundation Collecting as Practice Program. Uh, Francisco Correa Cordero, who is the Founder and Director of the Contemporary Art Space Lubov in Lower Manhattan and the Executive Coordinator at Independent Curators International in New York. Lubov is a contemporary art gallery which was established in 2016 that supports the production and exhibition of contemporary art uh, by emerging artists through commissions, solo exhibitions, and working collaboratively with curators and writers. Elisa Carollo is an art advisor and writer with special focus on 20th century art and contemporary art. After her experience with the art world in New York, Eliza is currently back in Milan, working with the family office, as well as a freelance advisor for collectors, galleries, art fairs, and artists. 
She's also currently serving on the advisory board for the Others Art Fair, which is to open this November in Turin. So thank you all so much for agreeing to be part of this and your very valuable contribution to our discussion today. I will hand over back to Patricia, uh, who will put a, uh, form the context on today's topic. Okay, so thank you, Sally, and thanks again, panelists, for joining us today. Um, over the next hour, we'll hear from each of the panelists um, who have prepared a few slides framing a snapshot of their relevant experience to broaden the discussion, followed by questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to briefly give some context to the subject using our own experience of working in and from Glasgow. Um, and now I'm going to share my screen and I have just a few slides also. So bear with me. Share screen. Keynote. Share. Okay. So that's our first slide. So we were invited to respond to reconsidering the local uh, by Lucy um, and explore what it takes to build a smaller, multiple maybe more connected art market. Um, my instinct was that the current art market um, needs to learn to be local. Um, so the aim of today's event is to have an open conversation to address the challenges and opportunities we have as a sector um, as a result of uh, COVID-19, um, the imbalance in the market in terms of diversity and our value systems, economy and the impact of all that we do on the environment. The two interdependent drivers of the art market, communities of artists and the market itself, galleries, fairs, auction houses, are not always compatible. This is the thing that um, we, we've witnessed from um, running the commercial gallery uh, from Glasgow. So this first slide is um, uh, an artwork very close to my heart. It was um, by Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Wynne Evans uh, called Cleave 03. And this was my very first um, international exhibition as a young curator at the International Venice Biennale in 2003. Um, so bringing together the criticality of these networks and our experience in the markets, um, we want to try and bring together those voices from within and outside of the sector also to help us share their knowledge of working within local networks and different economies. During my research for today, um, I've been really impressed with the direction of the Scottish Food and Drink Agency, for example, who over the last 10 years have grown the industry both here at home and internationally to a fifth, fifth, 15 billion uh, uh, British pounds, which is really staggering. Um, so if I, this is an image from our um, uh, international uh, art fair um, that we attended um, independent Brussels in 2008. Um, some of the experience that we had of, of being in an international context, you know, we, the, the collectors, the professional collectors around um, the art fairs, you know, are, are, are very um, beneficial to uh, the, obviously the sales within the market um, and the gallery, um, but also very aware of the length of time that it takes to be in these fairs, to reach um, these collectors and the value of being in these international contexts. You know, if you want to be um, active in the global marketplace, you have to be out internationally um, working in that scene. So the panel um, will touch on some of their experiences of both fairs um, and their local environments and touch on the value of the artistic communities operating outside of international art centres. And these are often economically poor areas, but critically rich centres of artistic production just going on to my slide here. Um, this is just um, a, a little snapshot of 
the local uh, building of um, the building collectors in a local capacity in, in Glasgow, our own um, art car boot sale that we do, which sees over um, 100 artists. We had um, uh, nearly 4,000 people, I think, through the doors uh, for each of the events, bring in almost, I, I know it's small money compared to the big figures we're talking about, but bring in £100,000 um, back into the local economy. Um, which helps artists pay for their studios going forward. Now, this first postcard, the, the very bright pink one, was by uh, was commissioned by um, uh, David Shrigley, um, the, the one underneath by Francis McGurn, and the one to the right uh, by Jim Lambie. Those names will probably be quite familiar to you because um, our artists are working internationally um, and international artists are local to somewhere. So we invite the audience to consider the value of the authentic experiences of these local locations and communities where art is made, the barriers to the marketplace and the impact the distance to the marketplace has on these communities. It is a fact that the further the market is from the center of production, the less economic trickle down there is back into the local scene. Posing the questions, how can the art market address the needs of its local community? Um, can access to the market be fairer? Will new models help decentralise control to help healthier, to create healthier ecosystems? And can we redefine value to invest in more meaningful economies? Um, and my last slide before we go to our panellists um, is, um, this is a slide from the recent art market report written by the um, uh, founder of Art, Economy, uh, art, e art Economies, um, Claire, Dr. Claire McAndrew. Um, and this table, you know, the figures are very impressive um, and largely charts the global um, nomadic and precarious jobs um, that we have in the sector. Um, and the the time that, that, that spent uh, within the, the art fair um, calendar um, and what is spent on travel and hospitality and accommodation doesn't then also show you the, the carbon footprint of that activity. It also doesn't ever talk about artist average earnings. Um, artists in Scotland earn an average um, 15,000 pounds in England, it's less than half of that. There is a global market worth $64.1 billion. We need to take this on and create a more sustainable sector. It needs investment and in infrastructure to see economic growth and real jobs in the sector. We cannot afford to ignore this anymore. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Zane to take over the platform with um, sharing his screen and I shall mute myself. Thank you, Zane. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you, Talia, as well, for inviting me to this conversation. I'm just gonna share my screen. Wicked. Cool. Um, so the premise of what I'll be talking about is, as Patricia, to sort of build on what she said, is fundamentally value and thinking about how we can begin to rethink value. Uh, and I'll be speaking from my experience of uh, as a community artist, as a writer, researcher, and cultural producer now. Uh, and this first image and slide hopefully will give you a, a, you know, an, an example of, of what I mean when I'm, when I'm discussing value in, in a very localized context. Um, so, to try and put it into sort of more tangible terms, this poster is of the author Zadie Smith. Uh, it's from an event I was involved in co-programming in 2016, which is around saving a community centre in, in Northwest London, uh, in Kilburn, South Kilburn to be specific. And essentially, this the context very briefly around this was the local authority wanting to turn that space into residential. Really, this is the question of, of, of when value comes into it, which is this is a community center, which is a hub of everyday creativity. 
um, which essentially, you know, comes from this idea of, of cult cultural, cultural democracy and the idea of everyone and anyone should be able to access culture. Um, and for the council or the local authority at the time, the value was in the economic value of demolishing a space which they believed is underused versus people on the ground who believed, right, okay, well, this space has actually incubated many artists, right? So not only that, it's a space of, 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 of rest, of welfare, of, of, that provides social services, where funerals are held, where weddings are held, uh, where community events are held. And really where Zadie Smith comes into this is that she grew up in a local area. And then she, she flew from New York to come and support and, and try and, and save the space. And, and really what she articulated was exactly that, that without this space, she would not have, have cultivated the sort of the ideas, the space to do her homework, the sort of the space for rest. It's not even just in productivity terms. So really this event is sort of an example of where I'm coming from as someone familiar with, with very local contexts in my own, uh, from my own background as someone who grew up in London. Um, and, you know, there are many other infrastructures of support for local people, uh, for people from, as Patricia framed it, um, you know, from, from low socioeconomic backgrounds, but who uh, are economically rich and, uh, sorry, not economically rich, um, you know, artistically rich in the ideas and, and, and sort of uh, what, what they hope to bring. Um, so, so hopefully that gives an example of, of my framing and thinking around value. Um, and I'll, I'll get onto that in a second in terms of how we can think beyond economic terms in, in the six minutes I think I have left. So moving on, um, Kidder Collective is, is a, a collective of British Muslim artists, um, which I co-founded in 2017. And in a similar way, thinking about space and value in, in the previous example I gave with Kidder Collective, it was about providing a space through a, a print journal for British Muslim artists to express themselves through fiction, illustration, photography, uh, and poetry. And we publish these, these magazines annually uh, as a, a space for artists to express themselves in the condition of sort of, you know, having the space to, to, to freely express yourself beyond the sort of limits placed on, on British Muslims' imaginations through, through various sociopolitical sort of, um, you know, framing around what Muslims should be or what, how they should occupy space, how, should, how they should think, etc. We really wanted to counter that artistically. Um, and, and, and in many ways, it, it links to creating a tangible space outside of the physical space for, for artists to be paid for their work, to, to see themselves represented, to exist in, in, a, in a community. And, and also we drew on the physical infrastructure of, of London in holding launches um, and liaising with the sort of rich artistic network of London, which includes community space, theatres and youth centres. Not limited that, to that either. It's, it included galleries as well, who sort of would offer a free space as well. Um, this is just an example of some artwork which featured in the zine by an artist called Rui de Silva. Um, for those unfamiliar with Brit British Muslim culture in London, uh, our communities tend to have an affinity with fillet of fish, which is why this is a fillet of fish in outer space. So essentially, Kidder Collective provided a, 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 a community uh, beyond just the idea of local, um, but based on a specific identity marker, um, which yeah, allowed artists uh, a sort of pipeline into, into fields, allowed them to express themselves, but also allowed them to fail. What ended up happening through doing Kidder Collective up until now was uh, a ripple effect. So networks would be built and eventually you'd have uh, publishers approach and say, can I talk to this particular artist um, to, or this writer to, to publish something on this? And I think that, you know, that created a sort of pipeline for emerging artists to, to, to really kick on and, and develop their practice. And to give you a sort of tangible example of 
what these community arts organizations can do in through Kidder Collective or through local infrastructure. Uh, and it's not just limited to obviously Kidder or local community spaces. I'll move, I'll briefly touch bit touch on before I end sort of the broader infrastructure that I've encountered. But to give you a tangible example, in this case, our illustration editor, um, through her work uh, through Kidder Collective, through illustrating this front cover for our second issue, through doing lots of artistic work and developing her practice, uh, Alal Saraji, she ended up, uh, she's now doing her debut solo exhibition that opens this week at P21 Gallery in, in, in London, uh, in King's Cross, um, which is not only because of Kidder Collective, of course, but what I mean to say is there are you know, that if there is an infrastructure of support through community arts organizations, through local infrastructure, um, this can have a huge impact in artists being able to access local, mar uh, local, uh, local markets and also be able to access ways of sustaining themselves economically um, and seeing, uh, seeing being an artist as a profession that they can realistically think is, you know, something to do as a career which for many people from, from marginalized backgrounds is, is, is a, not to homogenize it, but is, you know, something that might be seem, seem inconceivable. Um, so to end, I think I've on the eighth minute of my allotted time. So just to end to sort of like a circle back to the idea of, of, of value uh, in my own research around community arts organizations, um, I, I discovered very similar themes around, you know, the idea of local infrastructure providing that essential support, places like Art Share LA, who essentially subsidize, uh, who have networks within local art markets and expose the local artists that they platform um, and creative growth in Oakland. And for example, Rabbits Road Press in Newham in, in East London, which runs a Rizograph printing press. Uh, for, for the local community. And really the fundamental of what I'm trying to say in, in framing all of that is that there is a, a social value placed on, on these spaces, whether they are physical buildings or whether they are communities. And essentially they provide, you know, an incubation hub for, for these artists. Uh, and I think the crux of that is thinking about value, not just in economic terms, but in social terms. And the measurement for that is, is I think, urgent and necessary. Thank you. So thank you so much uh, for that, Zane. Um, and thank you for uh, sticking with the time as well. I know we've got some questions to come back and unpick some of those things. So thank you. If I could just hand over to Rose now. Hi, yeah, I'm just, I thought maybe I'll try and get my, uh, my, my clock up so I can get my timer on as well. Um, Thank you. Okay, so let me try and share my screen with everybody without sharing you all my secrets. Um, great, can you see that? Hope that is a yes. So um, thank you, Zane. That was really interesting as well as a kind of a kind of counterpoint. Um, I'm going to kind of whiz through a few of the projects that I've been working on, maybe in the last kind of five years or so. Um, but just actually a kind of very brief note on my background and kind of trajectory, which I think um, kind of you know in some respects is very different, and in some respects kind of responds to some of the same kind of sets of concerns. I mean, I started as a curator maybe 15 years ago or so in kind of commissioning and social practice and public art and all of those things that were really kind of underpinned by, I guess, a kind of interest in process, in space, in kind of interactions with people, in ideas about participation. Um, and also, I think, in an idea of like how art fits into that kind of broader social, cultural landscape and what it does and how it can be an agent in change and community and dialogue. Um, but I think also what was going on kind of for me personally, as well as the artists that I was working with, was that I was starting probably, I don't know, around sort of 2010 or so in particular to really be very conscious of how a kind of, set of a sort of set of changes that I was experiencing 
um, were kind of affecting the, the ideas of production and distribution um, that I was kind of involved in. And obviously that was partly to do with this kind of ever kind of developing art market in particular in London, but also I guess obviously like austerity and the withdrawal of public funds for art, for our education, things like the financialization of, financialization of real estate. So all of these things that were making it much more difficult and harder and harder for artists, I guess, to kind of carve out the, the time and the space just to make work, to be in the city. Um, but also, I guess, that there were changes in practice that I was seeing so that that were, that were kind of redefining how artists who were had been maybe more traditional, traditionally kind of hostile or at least ambivalent to being involved in the art market were both starting to become interested in it, starting to use it, but also being kind of used by it and wanting to have some kind of agency over that. Um, and I think at that point, so this is kind of maybe six or seven years ago, I started to work on a series of projects that really tried to more explicitly understand what those kind of economic frameworks were and how that support net, or that kind of support framework needed to be thought about as a way of, um, kind of continuing to, to support a really broad spectrum of art and of artist practice. Um, so, so just to touch briefly on a couple of projects, the, the first one um, that kind of with that background in mind that I, that I started working on really two things in parallel. One was a series of kind of commissions for collections that were happening um, with different museums across the UK. So again, really kind of continuing, I guess, to investigate like, the making of new work and of process and of Im immateriality, um, but thinking about that in terms of how that interacted with collections, how that would be preserved. Um, so the one that I've got up on the screen here is um, a, one of the very first ones I did that was a, um, a commission by an artist called Ben Kane up at the Grundy Museum in Blackpool. Um, so in the first image, you can see the 16 paintings that are from the collection and their different kind of drawings and collections. And, you know, they're very varied in terms of their kind of quote unquote value, both kind of financial value and also sort of art historical value. Um, but Ben then worked with a series of kind of locally based artists and craftspeople to have them to have objects that were within those paintings. So a table or a wheelbarrow or a necklace or a uh, a set of vases, or in fact, there's some sticks from a, from one that's a, a somebody on a beach with a dog, um, have those kind of fabricated and then introduced into the gallery as kind of new sculptures. Um, so he gave each of these kind of makers a, a set of instructions um, and asked them to kind of remake it. Um, but beyond this, they could kind of do how do it do whatever they wanted with it. Um, and really, what you ended up with with this kind of collection of new objects that. Were, were then accessioned into the collection, but as part of a kind of new handling collection. So they are very explicitly there to be used and reused and kind of continue to be part of a kind of ongoing sort of cycle of making within the collection. Um, so the second, uh, oh, let me see if I can, the second thing that I was doing at that time was working um, in my home. And I had just suddenly kind of moved house and had a had a spare bedroom for the first time um, ever, really, actually. And I think, I mean, anybody that lives in London knows that very few people of our generation and doing what we do in the in the in the art world has a spare bedroom. So it felt like quite a big deal to me. And I really wanted to kind of use that. Um, so I'm just going to kind of I'm not going to talk individually about any of these projects, um, but over a series of kind of maybe three or four years. I started to invite different artists in both to do things in my spare bedroom and then around that to uh, host dinners, to host kind of performances, to, to really in that sense kind of provide a space that was this kind of intimate space for thinking about how these works that were very performance based and very kind of ephemeral uh, could be collected, could be accommodated into a kind of domestic setting. Um, and I think for, for me, both within the museum and in my home, there was something about this notion of kind of expanding how protest, process and context and performance kind of existed within collections and in particular in the home environment, how that was something that could kind of quote unquote be, be, be lived with. Um, so the second project I was gonna to touch on 
uh, was with the Delfina Foundation. So I spent three years working with Delfina um, on their Collecting as Practice project, um, which really I think was a kind of residency program and a set of public programs that looked at collecting, uh, both in terms of the kind of aesthetics and ethics of it, but also thinking about different modes of collecting, thinking about collections as a site for kind of active engagement again, you know, in the development of kind of cultural identity and revisionist histories and new narratives. Um, and in that sense, to trying to think about the idea of collecting and of the market as going beyond the kind of accumulation of individual artworks and more to thinking about that as a critical discourse, to thinking about how different art scenes in different places have different kind of requirements and the ways in which both private collectors and also artists can kind of be active agents in supporting that, thinking about those kinds of interventions, thinking about that kind of infrastructure that we very often take for granted here in the UK in particular, and how those different scenes kind of articulate themselves across a kind of different spectrum apart from anything of, of public and private, and, and really that there's a kind of flexibility to that and a, and a kind of uh, fluidity to that that can be really useful in terms of supporting kind of ecosystems. Um, so I'm aware that I'm coming up on my on my eight minutes, but very briefly, the project that I'm working on now, which as you can see was supposed to happen last summer, and I haven't actually even up, I updated the, the logo yet, so that needs to be done, is a project called Performance Exchange. Um, and I think again that really for me kind of arises within this kind of constraint of a very different kind of art landscape. Um, so just very briefly, the idea of performance exchange was to host a series, is to host a series of performances across 20 different commercial galleries in London, each of those performances by an artist that is represented by that gallery. So partly to talk about the way in which galleries do support artists in the long term and particularly supporting artists whose practice is not kind of obviously um, within the kind of market framework. But also then we've got three museums that will also take an acquisition from that. So again, thinking about that slightly different kind of public private um, uh, conversation, thinking about the way that that kind of economics of practice needs to be rendered very kind of visible and made very kind of explicit within the future of kind of all of our kind of distribution presentation um, kind of practice kind of modes um, and understanding that artists in that sense now really kind of work across a spectrum of materialities and that in order for us to to kind of understand what contemporary art looks like from a really kind of zoomed out place we need to find methods and frameworks which support the the kind of circulation of all of those all of that kind of spectrum of materiality um, so in that sense, I think, you know, a lot of what I've been doing right now, um, and maybe this is where this kind of, again, sort of comes back to that bigger conversation that, that Patricia was hinting at, is thinking about, okay, so what is the framework for collecting? What are these range of practices? And where are their tensions between what artists want to do and what can, it, what can kind of happily sort of circulate in those collecting contexts? And how can we kind of make different types of practices, different types of materialities, different types of artists kind of visible within those circulating uh, frameworks. So I think I've gone way over time, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. That was really interesting. Uh, we're going to hand over to Francisco now. Thank you so much, Talia. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Francisco. Um, I am originally from Mexico and I've lived in New York uh, for 13 years. And I'm gonna speak a little bit about uh, my experience here in New York during the pandemic, uh, some of the challenges and uh, lessons learned. I'm gonna share my screen. <clears throat> um, I have a gallery space in Lower Manhattan and I also work at an arts uh, nonprofit organization here in New York. Um, I started the gallery four years ago in an effort to create a permanent home for exhibitions and public programs that I had been organizing in several different locations for a few years already. Um, I didn't 
um, have any collectors really when I started. But one of the advantages of being in New York is um, the huge amount of traffic uh, that galleries get of people from um, all over the world who are curious and actively seeking new art. And um, unfortunately, that isn't the case anymore right now. Um, I work primarily with emerging artists, which sometimes can be a challenge uh, because they're often artists that people haven't really heard of before. So you don't really know what their trajectory is. On the other hand, emerging work has um, lower price points, uh, which in the right context can be easier for people to purchase. Um, I reopened the gallery a month ago and I think the landscape has changed a lot because of the pandemic. Um, the full effects I think that it will have on the city are still yet to be seen or experienced. For an art community here that runs on freelance gigs and the premise of seeing art in person, this has meant hundreds of shuttered galleries and art spaces as well as, as, well as unemployed artists in a country where that political climate intensifies uh, with every week that goes by. So many artists here work freelance production jobs in galleries and museums, um, all of which have been closed uh, for like over six months. Galleries in turn, we rely on collectors who um, most of them escaped uh, to their country homes. Since I reopened a month ago, I think one of the main challenges that I'm facing right now is getting people into the gallery. Many of the critics and collectors that often come to see my shows simply haven't returned to New York and some uh, don't even have plans to return until next year. I think for this reason, um, online viewing rooms and online initiatives uh, are here to stay. At the beginning of the pandemic, um, galleries had no choice but to shift their programming online. Uh, I didn't, uh, and I don't have an online viewing room for my gallery, mostly because I thought that there was already too much noise online at the beginning, and I just didn't want to add any more myself. I thought I couldn't really compete um, with the bigger galleries for attention, but I did participate in online programs initiated by other organizations, uh, such as the New Art Dealers Association. And these have been incredibly successful. Um, I was very skeptical at the beginning. Um, I just wasn't sure how they were going to be received, uh, but I was really impressed by the support that people, collectors, and even other artists showed um, just to help each other out. I don't think I would have had that kind of success if I had done it alone by myself. Uh, most recently, something really interesting that has started happening in the last two months, just as galleries started reopening slowly, uh, is an increasing number of um, hyper-local initiatives to bring people into the galleries, um, such as gallery walks, tours and that type of programs in an effort to just like get people back into the galleries and seeing shows in person. Obviously there's always been events like this, um, but I think that what we're going to see is a doubling down on these uh, types of programs, including gallery exchanges. Um, oh, sorry. I don't know what the screen went. Bear with me one second. Um, I think that you know gallery exchanges uh, such as Condo that um, galleries started doing a few years ago. Um, you know we started realizing how productive these can be, uh, and it's a phenomenon that is happening in many countries all around the world. So uh, I just expect more and more of these types of events. Um, I think uh, these exchanges lead to deeper and long-term relationships between galleries, which can be extremely fruitful in the long run. I started exploring these opportunities last year by working with a group of collaborators in Switzerland, which led to a series of exchanges of artists, exhibitions, and resources. The main objective always being just to help each other out and giving each other visibility and growing together, basically.
and these relationships become uh, long-term and ongoing. And essentially, I think there's still a lot of different ways to collaborate with one another locally and internationally. And moving forward, I think we're going to be exploring a lot of uh, new different ideas and types of projects. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, can we head over to Elisa's presentation now? Uh, Elisa, I think you're on mute. Yeah, here we are. Thank you, Talia, and thank you, Patricia, for inviting me to this panel. Also, all the other interventions were very interesting. And well, when I, I was invited, the title was kind of very resonating with me because when I I had to come back to Italy from New York, I kind of had to reconsider the local and learn again to be local. So in this sense, I really enjoyed and accepting in being part of the board of the others for this edition of the others, which is a fair kind held in every year in touring during the art week, but I think I think they had this kind of format and mission, which is something so much needed today, especially after the pandemic, uh, because they always have been focused first and foremost in providing exposure to more emerging art proposal and emerging artists, but in sense of hosting and giving space uh, to artists run spaces or curatorial project based uh, so they want to be more rather than a fair, they have always tried to be more a platform of exchange and conversation. And the other big point in thinking about how those events, how those fairs can be really creating value also on the local scene is that they decide, always have elected to uh, take over abandoned buildings. And every time they are recovering those buildings and giving them back to the community, bringing them back to the community as a place for art, for living through enjoying art and culture. Also this year, they decided to take back to Turin another very significant and symbolic building, the Torino Exhibition Pavilion, which has been regrettably forgotten for years since at least the, the last Winter Olympics, which is kind of um, no sense because it's a, such an important building also for Italian or modern architecture as it was designed by Ettore Sozzas and uh, and Pierluigi Nervi. So this is just a starting point to say, to start to think how, how those fairs, how those biennials, which uh, over the past years have been doubling, they have expanding so much all across the world. Just last year, Uh, I don't think I have the video now. Sorry, uh, just I last year uh, we had more than. Elisa, I think we're experiencing some issues with your sound. Yeah. So, would you mind just repeating the last few bits of your presentation? I think we just missed a minute or two. I can restart as well. Uh, we got most of it. It's just yeah. that you we couldn't hear you for the. Last um, okay. 
maybe without the, the video is better. So I was saying just how those kind of fairs, how those kind of events can really create the value also and first to the local scene, because we have seen how these big events are art basel or freeze, they are expanding and colonizing places all over the world, the main capitals, but very little leaving something behind them after the week event uh, for the local communities. And in this sense, we, I think the, also the pandemic have forced to explore new kind of events, new kind of formats. We have seen just last week, as also Francisco was well addressing, this kind of new idea of a fair, which is a fair exhibition, and it's spreading across the cities, and it's engaging with directly uh, with the for, first with the local galleries who are hosting other galleries from other countries. So in this way, we can activate the local art community and create this conversation, but real conversation and cooperation, which can be built over the future also for new projects between galleries from different cities and different local art scene. So those kind of new events also next week uh, for the um, Turin Art Week, we will see Artissima, which will explore something similar. In this case, Artissima will uh, collaborate directly with the foundation, Turin Foundation of Museums. So they will be having an exhibition through three different museums uh, and uh, and which will be on until generally actually. So it's even more and provide an opportunity to activate the local scene and create an opportunities also for the long term between institutions to collaborate with the so-called market. Uh, also, this is a new, I believe that this will be the new, the new format that is something that can really build on the uh, local value as well, uh, because we are all those kind of events we we see even in Miami when the fair is gone, the local art scene was never able to really build something strong, especially for the more emerging artists and galleries. And it's interesting that this new initiative they just announced it, that they will have instead of Art Basel, they will have this program of residency, but also in this time uh, in this occasion the main point will be they will be really able to engage and make part of this initiative the locals the local owner of the space who will need to um, offer the space to the artist as well and so this is the main point and that's where the art world can really um, somehow come together with cultural district and smart cities policy, opening up, I feel, a whole range of unprecedented opportunity for the arts, both in terms of impacts and terms of fund fundings. Because what we need, really need to question is how we can engage with the local community. Uh, it's first how we can build the local community, how we can take it to the arts. So it's all a kind of, building on a process of audience development and community building, uh, which requires at least at the beginning to adopt first of all participative approaches aiming to activate those community and creating this capability which will help them to appreciate and this kind of exhibition contemporary art, which can be seen very as something remote for most of the people when you are not familiar uh, yet with the arts and the art world. In this sense, we, we can really think about those events, fairs, or no more flare, fairs, but like platforms and what were the biennials as some community events and activators for a larger discourse for the future and try, trying to build value and activate the community for the future and have new audiences also for the arts and new funds for the arts. 
So that's essentially what I, I think now we should work on. I'm sorry for the problems with the connection. Uh, okay. No, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Thank you so much, Elisa. And thank you all for some uh, great presentations. I'm really glad that we got to cover all these broad topics and bring uh, all your perspectives into this conversation. I think there's some really important issues raised and I hope we can uh, raise some of them in the questions uh, at the end. So if the audience has any questions, please send them now to the question and answer uh, function and we'll direct them to the panelists accordingly. Um, I would like to touch a bit on Zane's presentation and especially because I, I remembered a point that was mentioned in the last FOTAM event that I found really interesting, uh, that the traditional art market has always played chase with the, with the new, the innovators, and the observation that what later becomes trendy and then profitable usually comes from the bottom up. And because a lot of your research is based on these uh, places that foster everyday creativity, like you mentioned, and, that, and the importance of sustaining culture for the long term and investing in these spaces. So uh, I would like to hear your perspective on how the, the art market itself, and if, if we're building a new art market, how can this address uh, the actual needs of its community and also reflect these practices that have been overlooked so far? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, my research that I did, the research report, which was on community arts and the idea of sustainability, because I found through my own experiences at that intersection of, of working both you know as a as someone who accessed you know got into this culture cultural sector through these spaces through a youth center that was my access point um and noticing the level of burnout within you know people who dedicate their lives to sort of providing that basic infrastructure for everyday creativity and how these projects would sort of burn out so uh that was the premise of of doing the research and to answer your, your question more specifically, I think there are different models. I think there are individual models of organizations that are you know, self-sustaining and leveraging, you could say the art market. Um, I have to say it isn't contemporary arts and visual arts isn't my specialism, but in doing that research in America, there were case studies like Art Share LA that where curators would leverage their contacts within a particular art market and and essentially draw on the sort of the talents of artists who would access that space the art share la sorry i should give some context to it is is a, is a gallery in in east la i believe and essentially provided a space for emerging artists um uh, from that local community and beyond not only a space to to share their work but also provides a sort of art hotel concept um, to provide like actual like living arrangements, subsidized living space as well. Um, so, I mean, that's one individual example. I think in a more broader systemic sense, because it is about systems and frameworks, a lot of it comes down to redistributing and redistributing, uh, you know, essentially resource back into the communities that are you know, are, are these hubs and are these sort of pipelines? Um, and, and sometimes it's about thinking, just to reiterate the point about value, thinking about, you know, one thing COVID has revealed to build on points that have been made um, in the presentations is, is, is that, for example, during this period of sort of, the, during the global pandemic, we all were, were recognizing how crucial the local is as you're, as you're in your homes. And also not beyond just culture and arts um, for survival in very basic ways of sort of, you know, we, we had a situation in London where people would recognize community spaces as hubs of actually giving out food parcels, for example. Um, 
so so really it's about framing the social value and 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 therefore recognizing that there needs to be a, a system change and and fundamentally redistributing back into these spaces through investment um i know it's very broad a broad brush thing to say um i don't have the specific answer but that's my i think there are case studies which can help us survive in the short term that were in the report and i think there's more systemic answers Thank you, and um, I'm glad you touched on value as well, because this whole series is called Re Redefining Value in the Art Market, and a, it ties it in with the question I had for Rose, who has been working with uh, public and private collections to, to explore new ways of preserving these art practices. and and methodologies that have often uh, that, that often fall out of the traditional realms of the art market. So I was wondering, because you have a really close relationship, this uh, collector and artist relationship, how does this value, how is this value communicated uh, in these situations? And also, how can we redefine the value as we currently know it in order to invest in this more meaningful, in a more meaningful market and a more meaningful economy? I mean, I think, gosh, obviously, as, as Zane's just said there, I mean, they're kind of huge systemic questions. I mean, particularly, I guess, thinking about like this idea of like, you know, first of all, I'd say there's not just one art market apart from anything. I mean, I think just to kind of continue the, the, that line of thought around, you know, who is the art market for? I would say, you know, if you look at things that have happened really recently, like the, the um, uh, uh, artist support pledge that kind of happened in, uh, you know, on the kind of Instagram here, which has been this humongous thing that supported a huge amount of artists um, and really kind of in that sense points to a very different kind of market and a very different kind of scale and so you know the idea that you sell something for 200 pounds but if you if you sell enough 200 pounds then you know you've got something that's incredibly impactful and I think you know that as an as a market is a completely different thing to the kind of you know blue chip you know, big global art fairs that we're that we're that we're often kind of like having in our minds when we're talking about um, uh, the art market in that sense. But I think again, also, you know, what what we're looking at right now is a, is a really radically kind of different economic kind of framework within which artists are trying to make work. So whereas you know, even I mean, in, in a city like London, even. 20 or 30 years ago, maybe, you could squat, your education was free, you could probably live on the dole and be kind of okay. And so it was much easier to make work without, or just to live, let's say, without having a really kind of very expensive bottom line. You know, the amount of money that it costs to have a studio, have somewhere to live, travel, just basically be in the city now is so radically different that I think that, that we're all kind of playing a bit catch up in terms of what that means for some of those kind of like assumptions and myths that we inherited about the, you know, what the public sector is, what the private sector is, what the market is. And what you're seeing now is a kind of generation of artists who are trying to figure out how something can be, you know, how, how something can be for sale, how something that can be kind of within the market is not necessarily a question of it kind of losing its integrity. And that this idea that, that being anti-commercial is a, is a kind of uh, a sort of very particular kind of political stance is really difficult to uphold now, unless you've got your money coming from somewhere else and the rest of us are all kind of figuring out how to make a living just to stay kind of afloat and do it so so a lot of the work that I'm doing in that sense I think is around this idea of creating frameworks for which for within which artists can think about how to kind of have their practices being bought and sold and collected in that sense without them 
somehow kind of selling out or the artwork itself losing its integrity. And I think that that for me is kind of becomes key in terms of thinking about, well, what is a kind of ecosystem that supports this really big broad spectrum of practice that artists do without them having to somehow necessarily kind of either be in the market or out of the market. And, and, and really what we're talking about is a much more kind of fluid kind of uh, set of constellations that need to be able to kind of form around an individual's practice rather than these very straight kind of set boundaries and binaries that I think that that certainly my kind of art education sort of embedded within my kind of thinking and I think now with you know the, for me a lot of it is like how do I break out of that kind of binary set of public private good bad critical commercial and actually deal with with individual people deal with individual contexts on a kind of one-on-one -on -one basis thanks for that um rose that was um I really um, I had to understand the concept of, you know, big, big um, kind of meaty subjects. But I, I guess if we don't start having the conversations in, uh, you know, step by step, the, these subjects will always feel insurmountable. Um, and I think the panel uh, today is, is just given us a snapshot of um, the different ways that we've all in our own work and experience have been one experiencing the challenges but two being very innovative in the way that we work within those um, those systems but you know I, I think there is a, a kind of re reboot <laughs> um, happening um, which is very exciting where um, we have often felt, you know, myself starting a commercial gallery um, at the height of the first economic recession um, and um, coming on to um, Francisco to ask you a, a few questions um, about your experiences of, of being a relatively, you know, young gallerist as well. Um, that, um, and congratulations for uh, reopening again as well. You know, that's very exciting. As you see, um, it's very disconcerting when you're kind of walking down a street and, and, and all of the galleries that you maybe took for granted, the shutters are, are still closed or indeed the galleries are, are leaving. Um, we know this is happening around those art world centres uh, in London. Um, you know, another big one uh, last this week. Um, so we um, just to sort of frame the, the question about um, do we? I, I really liked your comment about um, the, the the hyper local um, activities now that are being sort of boost, boosting, trying to bring traffic back into the centre and into the galleries. I guess I think I asked you this uh, previously that. You know, with the art markets on, um, with the, 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 the physical markets on pause um, and this rebooting, um, there is a, a, a danger, I guess, um, that all of this great work could be forgotten um, when everything starts up again, if that's the way things are going to go. And, and, and will, do you see galleries, you know, um, just going back to the same behaviours? Um, or do you think there's things that will stay um, because they have been valuable to the galleries um, you know, in building those local um, structures and also the impact that I know we all, you know, really, you know, wrestle with uh, on the environment uh, from traveling to fairs and uh, et cetera. So if I could just, that, that access be fairer, not just to us um, and, and artists and, and younger galleries, but also on the environment. Um, thank you. Yes, no, I, I think that um, uh, the pandemic just made us uh, reevaluate everything that we were doing and maybe had been doing for many years. Uh, I think a lot of us realized that perhaps uh, we were working at a, 
at a pace that was just um, unsustainable um, with, you know, traveling to fairs all the time and then doing these big shows one after another. Um, I think especially for younger galleries, there is this expectation that uh, to participate in fairs to be taken seriously. So when everything stopped suddenly, I think it was just uh, good to like rethink where I'm putting the bulk of my resources. Um, and just, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's an ongoing learning process, um, you know, in the sense that, you know, you know, maybe there are just better ways to invest than, you know, traveling, you know, to other parts of the country or the world and uh, maybe doing things that have more of an immediate impact with artists here um, in the city that could just, um, you know, help them um, in a way that, you know, yeah, I guess that just has a more immediate uh, result. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the market, can it be more fair? I think it can definitely always be more fair. Um, I think, you know, I think what we need is more transparency and community building and resource sharing. I think what happens a lot is that, you know, some galleries become sort of like the gatekeepers. And um, yeah, I think galleries are just extremely competitive uh, sometimes. Uh, so I think there just also needs to be a better understanding that galleries of all levels are extremely important uh, for the ecosystem. Oh, that was great. Thanks, um, Francisco, for that um, and candid answers as well. Can I um, just take in that um, slightly contentious term, the gatekeepers, um, forward into my question with Elisa. Um, and Elisa, um, that was a phenomenal image. Thank you so much on the, the Winter Olympics, um, the image by oh, Etor Stossas, is that right? Um, and you know the really interesting thing about um, working in uh, in Turin, uh, which happens to be a twin city of uh, Glasgow. Um, so we've been working with Turin uh, for a number of years. Um, but I think you know having the um, it recognised as the centre, probably the centre for contemporary art in Italy, but it's not um, seen. Um, as somewhere that um, is, you know, uh, eclipsing other centres um, in, in Italy, um, it, other cities, you know, obviously of, of Rome and Florence. And, you know, it seems to me that um, everywhere has a different, um, like everyone's got together and agreed, you know, we'll we'll be really good at this bit and we'll be really good at that bit and and let's do let's really focus on contemporary art throughout the whole month of November um and you know build those local audiences so I guess um uh, it's it's just a really interesting um way to work um and I wonder if these new models will help us um decentralize the, the control uh, to create that healthier ecosystem uh, going forward, uh, Elisa, that, that would be um, interesting to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I think that the main point is that Turin since the beginning, because of their policies, maybe now they are changing as I was telling you, but there was a great interaction and cooperation between different, a system of governance first, which was providing this network and to collaborate between what were the official institution for arts, what was this new emerging fair, and what were maybe bank institution and the politics. And so you create this great network can, that can plan an event and an art week all in all together and sharing resources, of course, which is important. And I think the art world needs to find a way to, to legitimize also this need for resources where there are resources. And there are big opportunity now, if we think about all the money that have been uh, destined by banks for the ESG investments, which also so many art projects can be part of that. 
So we need to find a way to create this conversation and in Turin, when they need to be to rethink their development, because the, the main point was Turin changing from an industrial city to a cultural city or creating a new industry, new business opportunity as well. And we see how arts can be very important in this tour and for many cities as you saw in Glasgow, as we saw maybe in Linz or Vancouver or Denver in US, you can really create opportunity, but I think you need this network. So we need to find a way to go out of this exclusivity. And I think these new formats of fair that we are seeing more as a platform spreading in the city will help us to activate this collaboration with local entities, municipalities, because you need those permissions, rather than having just the conference hall and you be in the big, the big fair, just isolating this town tower will only the art community will access. And maybe during the Sunday, the, the Sunday and Saturday, the family and local people will come and gallery will treat them well, they are not useful. You know, that's, uh, that's also not our problem sometimes just being able to create this conversa open conversation and be able to, to find these new funds. In this way, we can share and maybe create also a better ecosystem and not isolating it its own, I believe. Yeah, no, thanks. That's really interesting, Elisa. I, while uh, we've all been chatting, um, I think Thalia has been looking over some of the Q and A's from the audiences um, that I know Thalia will um, hopefully pitch to you. Um, I'm looking at some of them now, Thalia. Um, I hope you've been able to condense some of them. <laughs> um, so over to you, Thalia. Yeah, uh, I have tried to <laughs> read all of the questions. Uh, one that stands out is, uh, and I think this could be addressed to Elisa uh, from Brian Be Becafico. Uh, they say they are from Paris, which is a historically a town that is has been an international hub for the arts, but recently they don't uh, show, their, their shows don't represent as many local artists. And the question is to be more appealing to local, should we display local artists and support the local creative environment or should we display international artists that would other, otherwise be impossible to be seen by a local audience? I think uh, with your background in uh, organizing events that deal with both local and international galleries and issues generally for all the galleries now i've seen also in italy when i came back everyone was asking me just can you help us to connect with the great some great young artists in new york so we will be able to be more appealing for italian collectors because we have something new and they think this is hype i don't think we will change again i think because now this attention to just international artists when you were in the city as collector, Italian collector will collect African artists and uh, uh, as well in Paris maybe. The, all those trends were also built through the art fairs. They were built through these big events where we were really setting up these trends and showing you, you were seeing in the major gallery these kind of trends going on because everyone was having this kind of artists from a specific country or continents. Maybe now that necessarily collector cannot travel for at least probably for the entire year now, they won't be able to see this kind of unless online. So they will, I think they are starting again in focusing on the local art scene. I've been seeing collectors more willing to go maybe to artist studio, even in Milan. They are asking to go to artist studio to be connected with Italian artists to find the next one here. So I think even in Paris, something can go on in this sense, but we need to create this kind of opportunity in connecting also more friendly maybe 